Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. So grateful you're here today to worship the Lord Jesus together with us this morning. If you're a visitor here, let me do my housekeeping spiel. We got restrooms right through that door. If you find yourself outside and locked out somehow, that front door is always open. Uh, I got a nursery down the hallway for ages five and under. And then uh, if you uh, are a visitor here first time, we got a little visitor card. We'd love you to fill that out. Drop it in our offering boxes. There's one here, one at the entrance. Uh, We'd love to have you fill that out. So we can just say thank you for visiting with us. And as we begin worship today, I think Zach and Abigail are going to lead us in our prayer and scripture of invocation. So would you please do so? Thank you, Lord, that in Christ there is no condemnation. Lord, for all of us who are in you, we have been set free from the law of sin and death. We praise you so much for that, Lord. And I pray that you would bless our time here today, that we would glorify you, that you would draw us closer to you, and that we would walk out of here certainly better than we did walk in. We love you, Lord. Good morning. morning. Our first praise hymn this morning is The Solid Rock, page 406. And uh, let's sing all four verses this morning. Please stand if you're able. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I do not trust the sweetest friend. But only lean on Jesus' name. On grace a solid proof is All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every heart, Father God, we come to worship you today and we proclaim that Jesus is our solid rock. 
He is the firm foundation. He is the one who is the basis of of our ability to even come and worship you today. So, Father, we thank you for the work of Christ. And we thank you that we get to glorify you as a body of believers this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And welcome to worship this morning. A couple announcements as we get started. A reminder, uh, Wednesday nights, we've got something for the entire family. Wednesday nights, 6 p.m., Kids Connect and Youth. And we're uh, dropping kids off at the Breezeway now, right here in this glass glass, uh, door area. Drop your kids off there, check them in, get them where they need to go. And then Christianity 101, uh, at 6.15 p.m., we're going to be talking about what is the church uh, this Wednesday night. Hope you can join us at 6.15 for Christianity 101. Uh, also, uh, uh, just a reminder as well that we have uh, Sunday school classes for you as well. we got classes for all the kids, three adult classes, a uh, class with Dan Collette and also J.C. Murphy, who's been filling in in Dan's stead. Appreciate him doing that. Uh, light class with A.C., Journey class with Jeff Brewer. So we got classes on Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights for the whole family as well. Other thing coming up uh, in, uh, in April is going to be the second annual Cedar Rock Ladies Tea. And, uh, and so if you are interested in serving in any capacity or just learning more about it, next Sunday after worship service, uh, there will be an interest meeting. Uh, and so you can hang out for that next week. I sent out a, uh, a notice that was wrong. It's not today. It's next Sunday uh, that there is an interest meeting for that. Also, next Sunday is the first of the month, so what does that mean? First Sunday Fellowship, what time is that? 9.15, and what do you do? Well, okay, that's true. That's a true. What do you do before you eat? Bring a dish, there you go, very good. Bring a dish, and uh, it's a time of fellowship and the food growing together. So that's uh, next Sunday morning at 9.15. Hope you can join us for that time. And then if you are a parent of a youth, uh, intern Zach would like to meet with you for a couple things uh, to talk about discipleship now and a couple other things after the service down here somewhere. Where, Zach? Right there where Wayne is. So Wayne, right where there, there there's going to be a parents meeting for youth. So uh, Wayne and the youth parents will be right here uh, for that meeting. So uh, that'll be after the worship service. As we transition to our time of prayer uh, many, many things to pray for, people to pray for. Just to be candid, I'm not going to be able to get to them all. Uh, we got a lot of things to pray for, but you have a long list there on your bulletin. First, we want to continue to pray as, as our mission uh, as a church this year is to continue to grow deeper, wider, together, and higher. We want to pray uh, that we would continue to grow wider. And uh, I know we prayed for this last week, but it's worth praying for the Good News Club again at Everbest Elementary. Other things we want to lift up, we want to pray for Miss Irene Collins, uh, just her eyesight, some issues there. We want to continue to lift her up in prayer. It's, it is rare for Miss Irene to miss a Sunday, much less a couple in a row. So we just want to pray for her, uh, for Willis with his treatments as well. Um, Dan and, and Martha Collette, please continue to lift them up. Dan is recovering from his uh, fall and uh, arms in a sling. So we just want to lift up him and Miss Martha as she tends to him. Uh, and just want to pray for, the, for that whole family right now. Uh, continue to pray for, um, many of y'all know Dustin Moore, Hope Moore and her kids. Uh, they, they are usually here. Dustin's had some ongoing health issues. Please lift him in prayer. Katie's mom, Vicki Matthews, has um, uh, diagnosed with breast cancer, has surgery this Tuesday. So we would, uh, just our family would cover your prayers for her. Um, and then other, other things, uh, Jace Lester has a, a little Jace, has a surgery in February. I want to pray for the family of Jerry Turner, Miss Susan's uncle, Evelyn Jenkins Gillum, and others. So we got a long list of things to pray for. I know uh, in a room this size, there's so many more. Uh, but we do want to pause and go to the Lord in prayer uh, this morning for these and other needs as well this morning. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll have a brief moment of silence, and then we'll pray the Lord together. Father God, in the busyness and the hecticness of our lives, we rarely pause. And so, Father, today we as a body want to do that. Pause and first praise you for your glory. God, you are sovereign, you are in charge, you are holy, you are mighty. We want to look up and gaze at your glory and praise you for who you are. 
Secondly, Father, we want to confess our sins to You. All of us in this room this week have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And every believer in this room knows that apart from the work of Christ on the cross and faith in Jesus, that there is no hope for that sin. But we thank You that we have hope when we trust in Jesus. And we come before You and we confess our sins and failures to You knowing that you will forgive us on the work of, cross, of Christ on the cross. Father, we also come bearing thanksgiving. God, we thank you for uh, Miss Janet is here today, and, and, and she's had so much going on even in her own life, her health, and, and God, how she's thanking the church for all the prayers that we lifted up for her, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the work in her life, and for Miss um, Pam uh, as her mother, uh, Janet Gardner continues to have health issues. We thank you that she's able to be with us. We thank you for each and every person who is able to um, be here and gather and worship as a body this morning. We have so much to thank you for. And Father, we also come with many needs. Needs of health, needs of uh, burdens, very public burdens, very private burdens. God, you know each and every situation. You know the sufferings and the longings of each person in this room. We pray for those who are believers, God, that you would use the sufferings and trials of this life to, to sanctify us, to grow us more like Jesus. God, that you would use it to, to deepen our relationship with you. We pray for those who do not yet know Christ, that the sufferings of this life will push them to see their deep abiding need for a Savior, their deep abiding need for you. So Father, we come to you and we seek your face. We pray, Lord, that you would grant us wisdom. We pray, Lord, that you would grant us um, a desire to, to, as we say, and as we see in your word, to grow deeper in your word, to grow together in love, to grow wider as we reach others with the gospel and to grow, grow higher in worship and praise to our great and mighty King. We pray all this in Jesus' name. All right, our next praise hymn is Blessed Assurance, page 334. And with that, we will sing all three verses. Please stand if you're able. <clears throat>
morning, everybody. Uh, similar to last time I sang, we're going to have the lyrics up on the screen, and I invite you to stand and sing along if you know the song. Or if you don't, it's, it's not too good. Amen. Thank you, Zach. Thank you all for being here with us today. Again, kids, if you have a, uh, if you want to help follow along with the sermon, we've got these little um, kids' note guides there. You can uh, help take notes, and then uh, parents will provide you something to talk with with your kids on the way home. Uh, you seek to digest the, the God's Word and apply it to your lives. If you have a Bible this morning, let me see your Bibles. Very good. If you don't, we've got Burgundy Pew Bibles. You can grab one of those. We're going to be in Ephesians, chapter 1. Ephesians is in which testament? New Testament, right? And uh, who wrote it? 
Paul, very good, the Apostle Paul. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, we're continuing our study of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. As we uh, open God's Word, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him. Actually, no, no pray yet. We're going to read it together, then we're going to pray. That's what we're going to do. So if you're able, please stand in honor of God's Word. We'll read, then we'll pray. What I'm going to do, I'm going to read the whole gist of what we studied the last few weeks. We're going to focus on 11 through 14, but just to make it make sense, we're going to start in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. Verse 11, In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of is glory. This is the word of the Lord God's people said. Amen. Father God, may we be awed by the majesty of who you are. May we be, we be challenged to understand what it means to live for the glory of God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This week, um, we did some art projects with our kids, and, um, and they've been studying in their curriculum, they've been studying different artists like Picasso, Grandma Moses, Georgia O'Keeffe, um, a lot of stuff that I, I'm, I'm learning as I'm watching them learn, right? And, uh, and as part of their assignment, the kids had to create their own artwork to match or mimic the styles of Picasso and Grandma Moses and Georgia O'Keeffe. And so they did that one day, and I came home uh, from work, and we sat down for dinner, and Katie, you know, pointed out the kids' artwork hanging on the wall behind me. And it was as if you'd opened the gates and the bulls just started running, right? The kids started talking stream of conscious, talking over each other in long, winding sentences about the, the art there on the wall. Why do you think they were talking stream of conscious just all over each other with these long sentences? What do you think? They were excited. Yeah, they were excited. They could not wait to talk about the art that they had made, to get me to guess who did each one, to talk about why the Picasso ones all look very sad, all this kind of stuff. And they just started talking all over each other. Well, in the look at letter of Ephesians, that's this section we just read, verses 3 through 14, feels like Paul's kind of like my kids. <laughs> because Paul begins this letter to the church at Ephesus, he begins with the introduction, and then he begins with this long, winding, rambling sentence all about God. And you say, why is he doing this long sentence from verse 3 to verse 14 in the original language, all one sentence? Because he's excited. Excited about the glory of God. Now, our English translations helpfully 
break this long sentence up into several smaller sentences so our minds can track and comprehend what's going on here. But the main idea, the thing that Paul is so excited about that he just has to spill it all out is this. Main idea of this whole section is we bless God because God's blessed us. We bless God. We praise God because God has blessed us by choosing us, by adopting us, by lavishing his grace on us, by inviting us into this cosmic rule, coming kingdom where Christ is going to be king. And he does all of this, if you notice when we read it, in Christ, in him. I have circled in these verses all the mentions of in Christ, in him, etc. And it's all over those verses that we just read, which is why I think it's appropriate and timely. Zach, thank you for singing in Christ alone. because That's exactly what Paul's saying. It's in Christ alone that we have all of these blessings. But the sentence isn't over. Paul's still excited. He's got more to say. And so in today's passage, Paul is going to highlight two things that God has done for you, for me, for his church, for his glory. Number one, God has claimed us for his glory. God has claimed us for his glory. Verse 11 begins, in him we have obtained an inheritance. In him we have obtained an inheritance. In the original language, I'm not a Greek scholar. Miguel one day will be, kind of is right now. I'm not, but she is. But from what I've read, this verse is a little tricky to translate. ESV that I'm reading, and many of your translations render it as, in him we have obtained an inheritance. In other words, saying that Paul is saying that we are the ones getting an inheritance from God. Original language may be a little tricky to difficult. Some of the commentators, far smarter than me, think that maybe the original understanding was more closer to this. In him, we have been obtained as an inheritance. In other words, the way it currently reads, it sounds like that we are getting an inheritance. They say that maybe what Paul meant here is that we actually are the inheritance, that we are God's inheritance, that God has claimed his people as an inheritance. That seems to be what maybe Paul is saying here. God has claimed you as an inheritance, but he makes clear to say that we were not chosen at random. Look at what he says. In him we have been obtained as an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. When I read this week, the people who lived in Ephesus, this big city of the Roman Empire, were big believers in luck. They, uh, you know, how many of you like knock on wood when you say, I still do that sometimes. I knock on wood sometimes just to, you know, I hope this proves true. Well, they were big believers in luck. And in fact, so much so that government officials, when they would announce public actions or public things, that they would do so with a dedication to the goddess of luck. That's what a big deal luck was to the city of Ephesus. Even today, many, many folks are very big believers in luck, right? Paul's saying, you don't have to worry about that. It's not real. You don't need a lucky rabbit's foot. You don't need to knock on wood. You don't have to worry about black cats and broken mirrors. because We were not chosen by luck. No, he says God made us his inheritance according to his sovereign purpose and plan. As he works all things according to his master will as he's in charge of it all. In other words, God saved his church not by going eeny, meeny, miny, mo, right? God saved his people because he is a gracious, loving, powerful, and intentional God. I think of it kind of like this. Any of you all seen any of the Marvel movies? You were not telling the truth, I don't think. Okay, all right. Well, so the seven of you who claim to have watched Marvel movies will understand this. Um, you know, there's the Marvel, Iron Man, Thor, uh, those guys, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Q. All right, all right a couple of you all finally confessing up here. Here we go. Each of those movies, let's be honest, is kind of the same. Random no-name guy with some character flaws, gets some superpowers, becomes a hero, fins off a supervillain, and along the way learns some good character lessons about himself and becomes a better person, hopefully, right? That's generally the gist of all these movies. 
Well, in these movies, especially the early ones, there was always a bonus scene at the end of the movie, or kind of, you know, in the middle of the credits, at the end of the credits. And in this bonus scene, the main character, let's just say it's Iron Man, is sitting there doing his thing, uh, whatever, and in walks Samuel L. Jackson. He's not just Samuel L. Jackson. He's playing this guy named Nick Fury. It's Samuel L. Jackson wearing all black with an eye patch. And Samuel L. Jackson walks in and sits down beside whoever the main character of that movie is, and he says, hey, we're putting a team together. We need you for the Avengers Initiative. Something of that nature, right? Now, Samuel L. Jackson, Nick Fury, was not picking people by chance, right? He wasn't walking into the random 7-Eleven, finding uh, Average Joe getting his uh, can of Coke, getting ready to go back on the road and say, I need you for the Avengers Initiative. No, he was intentionally selecting a team for himself who would become the Avengers and save the world and all that jazz. Now, this is an imperfect analogy, a lot of flaws with it, but I think that's kind of what Paul's saying that God's done. God did not choose his inheritance by chance. He didn't go eeny, meeny, miny, mo. He didn't choose it by luck. He intentionally chose his people, the church. Here's the question, why? Why would he do this? Why would he choose us? We bring nothing to the table. Why would he do this? Here's why. Paul tells us, because he had an even greater purpose for you and for me. Verse 12, he chose us, here we go, so that... We, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. Paul's saying, listen, church at Ephesus, here's why God saved me, and here's why God saved you. God claimed me and claimed you, all these believers, so that we would be to the praise of his glory. He did all of this so you and I could glorify him. And this connects us back to the theme of the entire passage. The entire passage that I read to you a minute ago is all about the fact that we exist for the glory of God. We exist to praise and bless God. God made us for his glory. God saved us for his glory. To use the language of these verses, God claimed us as an inheritance for his glory. And what this means for us, just to kind of tease that out into our everyday lives, if God saved all of us for his glory, this means this. He doesn't just want Sunday mornings. See, we have a tendency to segment our lives. You know, we got our work box over here, got our entertainment box right here, family box right here, church box over here, right? We segment our lives into all these little boxes, and, and we got our Sunday over here, and we we, we have the rest of our lives over here, the sacred stuff's over here, the secular stuff's over there. And so on Sunday mornings, what do we do? We go to the church box, the faith box, open it up, get out our faith garb, put it on, come to church, look nice and pretty, wear it while we're at church, but when we go home, what do we do? Take it all off, put it back in the closet, we'll see you next Sunday, right? When we do that, it remains untouched the rest of the week as we go live the rest of our life. When we think that way, We go to work, we work just like everybody else. We go to school, kids, and we do school, act there just like everybody else. Parents, we parent our kids, don't ever mention the Lord, don't ever mention the things of God. When it's the end of the day, ready to entertain ourselves, we watch the same TV, the same social media, whatever, that everybody else in the world watches with no discernment. We go to our kids' games, and we act just like everybody else there. We, right, we go to the store, and we get mad at the checkout person because they're taking too long. We act just like everybody else there. God saved us to be for the praise of his glory. He wasn't just talking about Sunday mornings. He was talking about all of our lives. R.C. Sproul, hey, Richard's not here today, Richard Walker, biggest R.C. Sproul fan uh, that there is. So Richard, when you're watching later, this is for you. R.C. Sproul said, we do not segment our lives giving some time to God and some to our business or schooling while keeping parts to ourself. The idea is to live all of our lives in the presence of God, under the authority of God, and for the honor and glory of God. That is what the Christian life is all about. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God didn't claim you so you could give him the crumbs of your life. 
God claimed you so you might be praise his glory. And questions to ask yourself this morning. Number one, am I a believer in Jesus? Because if you're not, then none of this stuff matters. It's applicable, right? Have I truly repented of my sins and believed in Jesus? If not, then you're not yet a part of God's inheritance. You can't live for his glory unless you've surrendered to him and been saved. First most foundational question, am I a believer in Jesus? But for those of you who are, many of you who are, here's the question for you. In what part of my life am I not glorifying God? Where is the biggest inconsistency between what I say I believe, and how I practically act. You want to learn how to glorify God with all of your life. If you don't want to hold anything back from God, let me just offer a very specific challenge and opportunity. This, you know, one way to learn how to honor God with all of our lives is to dive into the church. To lean into the body of believers. Not just on Sunday mornings, but for the rest of the week as we live as a community of faith. Because We as a church have said that we are committed to growing deeper in our faith, growing together in love, and that sharpens us and makes us more holy, right? Growing wider as we reach others with this good news, growing higher in worship, all of this, right, to the glory of God. And so we as a church, we are better and we live life better and we uh, pursue God better when we are together in these things, when we live and exist as a true body of believers, not just people that show up on Sunday mornings for um, entertainment. Let me just say, if this is your entertainment, you've got pretty bad entertainment, right? More entertaining things in life. We as a church want to help each other glorify God in all of our life so we can glorify God as a body of believers. My challenge to you is, if you're not sure what this looks like, maybe that next step looks like taking that next step of commitment and being involved in a Sunday school class or coming to Christianity 101 pursuing church membership, something like that, to take that next step to lean into the body of believers, to be surrounded by a community that wants to live life for the glory of God. Francis Chan says, God is not just one thing we add to the mix called life. He wants an invitation from us to permeate everything and every part of us. In other words, God claimed us for his glory. That's not all that we see here from the Apostle Paul that we've done for his glory. God has claimed us for his glory. Number two, God has sealed us for his glory. God has sealed us for his glory. Verse 13. He says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Now as we... Tease this apart, break this out. A couple things we should notice here. Number one, notice the importance of hearing the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. God's word is not just a bunch of inspirational self-help talk, right? God's word is true. The truth. The, the, the thing that is so true, it's as true as one plus one equals two, right? It's the thing that we submit our lives to. We don't stand in judgment over God's word. We let it stand. We submit our lives to it and stand under its judgment. So God's word is true. And the gospel then is not just good advice. It's the message of our salvation. Romans 1.16, the apostle Paul says elsewhere, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Because the gospel is powerful. It's the only message that can save And these Ephesian believers were saved because they'd heard the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation. They'd heard the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation, because somebody told them, right? Church, we have an obligation to our neighbors to tell them the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation. In fact, More than that, we have a mission from Jesus Christ himself to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And lo, he's with us always, right? Even the end of the age. If it's true that we have this obligation, this commission to tell folks the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation, when's the last time you did that? 
last time you told someone about Jesus. Let's pray that God would equip us to speak this word of truth. Because it's true. This gospel of our salvation, because it's powerful. And we just challenge you and encourage you. It's scary, right, to do that. But it's amazing when you throw it out there and say, this is the good news of Jesus. God takes it and runs with it. It's not you or me that's going to save anybody. It's him through his word. So that's the one thing we want to notice, just the importance of hearing the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation. The second thing to notice, and it's really the main thrust of this passage, is that they believed this word of truth, the gospel of their salvation, and it says that they were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Now, who is the Holy Spirit? Uh, who, who is, what, is, what does he mean by fourteen? He tells us a little bit about who the Holy Spirit is. Verse 14, he says, Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory? Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, is the down payment of our divine inheritance. And I love what Paul is showing us here about the Holy Spirit. First off, in this whole section, he's talked about God the Father. He's talked about God the Son. He's talked about the Holy Spirit. He says they're all there. They're all active in our salvation in different ways. And then he says here just about the Spirit, that one particular aspect of the Spirit's ministry in our lives is this, that at the moment of salvation, the Spirit seals us, right? He seals us to the praise of the Father's glory. He's the guarantee, the down payment for the promises that God has given to his people. Let me think, think of it like this. My dad uh, retired at the end of last year. January 1, he began his retirement which is kind of weird for me because I've always known my dad to be, you know, businessman, very successful, all these things. And I, I didn't know how he'd handle retirement, not having all the work to do. Turns out he's handling it just fine so far. <laughs> uh, first off, I, I talked to him yesterday. He said he's chopped a lot of wood um, and uh, is the, the, uh, the wood uh, distributor to all the, the folks that need wood in that community, right? But he's also had a lot of freelance work, consulting work from his 40 years of working in the industry that he worked in. So he had already been to one consulting trip down to uh, Tampa, and he told me he has another trip planned, some former colleagues, associates uh, out in Seattle, and he told him, he said, look, if you want me to come, I'm retired. If you want me to come, you're going to need to pay me 20% up front. He said, uh, the check's in the mail, right? The check's already in the mail. It's already coming. Now think about that. Think about God. Church, God's done us one better. The moment we're saved, the down payment isn't just in the mail. It's there, right? In our hearts, in our lives, it's already there. There is no delay because the Spirit was there to allow us to be saved, and the Spirit is there, and is, we're blessed with it. At the moment of conversion, He is the down payment. He is the seal on our lives of what God is going to do through us. Just think about the Holy Spirit. Have you ever paused? And just reflected on the fact that the Holy Spirit has sealed you. Ever pause to reflect on the fact that the Holy Spirit of God has marked you as his child. He has permanently identified you with the God of the universe. If you know, think back, all of us were lost in our sins. We were far from the goodness and plan of God, filled with the darkness of the world. Deserving God's wrath and the judgment for our sins. But through the gospel, God saved us. And in a very real sense, in the moment, the Spirit entered our lives. S.M. Baugh calls it the intrusion of new creation into this age. The Spirit does not go away after the moment of your conversion. Christianity 101, a couple of Wednesday nights ago, we, we did a, actually it was last fall, we did a deep dive on who the Holy Spirit is and what the Spirit does in our lives. I'm going to give you the summary, the Cliff Notes versions of all the things the Spirit does in your life. You ready? The Spirit empowers your prayer. The Spirit gives you spiritual gifts to serve. The Spirit empowers the proclamation and the hearing of the gospel. The Spirit purifies you at the moment of salvation. The Spirit develops fruit of the Spirit in your lives. Spirit points you to Christ. The Spirit guides and directs you. He gives you assurance. He teaches and illumines through God's Word, the Scriptures. He builds the church together in unity. And I'm just scratching the surface. 
things the Holy Spirit does in our lives and in the church. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that is who is residing in you at this very moment. Sometimes we forget about the Holy Spirit. We call, he's the forgotten member of the Trinity. Sometimes we don't know what to do with the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. But what we see here and then in the rest of Scripture is that the Holy Spirit is within every believer in Jesus Christ, a little injection of the divine into our fleshly bodies. A question for application for you this morning. How might your life change if you fully realized that the Spirit of God is in your life? How might you be equipped to live the Christian life? And get this, all of our lives is for God's glory. How might you glorify God better if you realize that you're not doing it alone? The Spirit is there with you, helping you to live for God's glory. Because the truth is, we can't do it alone. If we're trying to glorify God on our own, we will fail miserably time and time again which is why God's granted us the Spirit to live within us. He's given us the Spirit to identify parts of our lives that need changing and correcting. He's given us the Spirit to empower us to seek change in our life. He's given us the Spirit to bind us together with fellow believers in Christ. The Spirit will work in and through us so we can live lives that glorify God. Quote Francis Chan one more time. He says, I don't want my life to be explainable without the Holy Spirit. I want people to look at my life and know that I couldn't be doing this by my own power. Because we can't do this by our own power. If we want to lean into being God's claimed people, if we want to glorify God, we can't do it alone. We do it through the Spirit. Praise the Lord for the Spirit's presence and power and the seal and the guarantee that he is on our life. As I think about these verses, and as I think about this entire passage that we've studied these past three weeks, I can't help but think about Bach. You're thinking, Bach? Like, what what are you talking about? Began the message talking about art, now let's talk about music a little bit. Y'all know who Bach is, right? Johann Sebastian Bach, um, one of the most famous composers of all time. Lived in Germany a long time ago, 1700s. He wrote these really technically brilliant musical compositions for a bunch of instruments. If you heard some music and and, and I said, that's Bach, you would recognize this music. Like, it's a really famous stuff he's written. Now, when you are as gifted as Bach, I can only imagine how easy it would be to claim the glory for yourself, right? I'm pretty good at this whole music deal. Uh, Give me a pat on the back. But Bach, I read, wrote two things on every piece of music he wrote. Every piece of music has two things. At the very front of every composition, he wrote JJ, which was short for Jesus or Jesu Java, Jesus help me. At the end of every composition, he wrote SDG, Soli Dei Dei Gracia, to God be the praise. Bach was incredibly gifted. He had all of these talents. To be sure, God had blessed him with this musical gifting. God, I mean, so God had blessed him, but Bach in return blessed God back. Everything he did was for the glory of God. As we come to the end of this long winding sentence, the same must be true with us. God has blessed us. He's blessed us in so many ways and in so many things that he's given us and, and given us the spirit and given us this calling and all these things. But God has blessed us so we can bless him. To live all for the glory of God. Will you live your life for his glory as well? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we exist for the glory of God. You have claimed us the glory of God. You've granted us your spirit for the glory of God. May we as individuals, may we as a congregation, live for the glory of God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. If you would stand, we want to sing hymn of invitation 410, It is well with my soul. I don't know what the Lord's doing in your heart and life, but I'd love to pray with you uh, if you feel so inclined. Please stand, we'll sing this together.
We thank you. We trust in Christ. It can be well with our souls. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You would be seated just for a moment. A couple things to do. For... Oh. Thank you when I get my, uh, my assistance here. Um, let me put my stuff down here. So uh, we present, first off, y'all know Abigail, uh, Zach's better half in, in all the ways, right? Um, so uh, I, I joke with Zach because, uh, you know, we've known Zach for a year and a half now, right? And, and Zach started dating Abigail during that time and stuff, and they got propo- he proposed and got engaged. And we finally met Abigail, and I say, you know, Abigail, she's kind of out of your, she's out of your league, Zach, you know? So I get why you went ahead and put the ring on, on the finger before she wised up. Anyway, she's been with us for a while, and she wants to pursue membership here at Cedar Rock by from Forest Baptist Church in Forest, Virginia, having a trust and believed in Jesus and following his baptism. So do we have a, uh, a motion to accept all of All in favor say amen. I amen. All right. So welcome Abigail as an official Cedar Rock member. Hand her the sign. She gets a sign for uh, those nice southeastern apartments. Uh, so there's that. And then, uh, Hannah, you come on up as well. And y'all can kind of stand up here in this section. Zach, you go over there too. All right. So y'all know Zach. Uh, y'all know Abigail. And now I want to introduce you to Hannah Rooks. Uh, and let me just give you the backstory here. Back in uh, 2017, uh, a long time ago, the deacons and I, we had a day-long prayer study preparation retreat. From that kind of came some things that we wanted to prioritize as a church, and it's amazing to see how God has answered those prayers in the years since. I mean, just astounding in a lot of ways. One of those was that we, uh, we, we wanted to form a greater connection to the seminary via internships as a way to bless our church, but also bless these, these potential people to, who are going to serve the church in a variety of capacities. Zach, of course, has been with us as a paid pastoral ministry intern since fall of 22, I think. And, uh, and he's going to continue in that position for the spring of 24. So he's our paid pastoral ministry intern for spring of 24. But within a week of each other, a few months ago, a month or two ago, uh, both Abigail and Hannah Rooks um, reached out to me, seeing if we would have capacity or interest in having internships for them as well, uh, because they needed internships for their class credit. Abigail, of course, we know Abigail, and, uh, and Hannah, if you have not met Hannah yet, she is a, a member at North Wake Church, and a friend of a friend connected us there, and she, uh, with her degree program, needs a, a mentored inter- internship, practicum, that's the word, a practicum in a, in a church, and they just, North Wake was not able to, to do the things that she needed to do for that internship. So uh, we had this opportunity, two different people who wanted to serve, uh, needed class credit to serve as interns. So we went to the deacons, deacons met with both of them, unanimously brought them aboard as uh, interns for the spring of 2024. Um, and their responsibilities are a little different, just clarification, so, so you don't hound both of these two with stuff. Zach is paid pastoral ministry intern. He has responsibilities around the church in a lot of things, leading the youth, from leading the youth to changing the church sign to getting the sermon up online, and everything in between. Uh, uh, Abigail and um, Hannah are going to serve, uh, mostly have kind of semester-long projects they're going to do to help bless our church. And in addition, going to serve like anybody else around the church. And, uh, and then we're going to meet all three of us for in- intern meetings throughout the semester as part of their uh, class credit as well. So um, we're just excited that, again, the Lord's working and doing things and stuff's just dropping in our laps and we just have to say yes to stuff. So uh, we're excited to have Abigail and Hannah Rooks on board uh, as interns for spring of 2024. So would you give them a hearty Cedar Rock welcome? And so after the service, we'd love for you to come by and talk to them and and just uh, uh, welcome Abigail in membership and welcome her as a spring intern and welcome Hannah as a spring intern as well. And we're just excited for the Lord to going to do in and through these folks and in and through uh, our church this spring as we live and worship, uh, live for the glory of God and worship Him as well. Let me uh, conclude our time together. The benediction from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly 
in all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Go with God this week.